Major funding for this program was provided by the National Endowment for the Arts. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Central Educational Network. Mid-February in eastern South Dakota, the wind chill is minus 45. It's what the old timers called weather not fit for man nor beast. And certainly not in these old barns. They were built years ago for dairy cattle, for beef, for hogs, horses, and poultry. This one dates back to 1916. It's owned by a father and his son, Joe and Leon Sparks. Leon is the third generation on this place. From the outside, you'd think this was just another drafty old South Dakota barn. But inside, it's warm and cozy. Joe and Leon might have let it fall apart. Instead, they fixed up the 75-year-old structure and made it useful for their hog operation. This is modern American agriculture. Hogs farrow year-round in this insulated, temperature-controlled facility where contented sows nurse their piglets under the eyes of the Sparts family, who found a new use for an old farm building. A hundred years ago, 85% of Americans lived on farms. Today, 85% of us live in urban areas. And a whole generation of Americans is growing up with little knowledge of rural life. If a barn isn't somewhere in our backgrounds, I think we're all disadvantaged folks. If you were a little kid and just went out and sat in an old wagon under a shed when you were a child, I think you were richer for pretending that it was the cowboys and Indians or something, you know, it was a, it was a fantasy. And it's a, it's a mystery, it's a romance. A, a barn is a romance, it's part of the history of this country. To me, the question is not why do people find barns attractive, but why did it take so long before people did understand that they're attractive? It, it's so many people who grew up on the farm and remembered primarily the pain, the difficulty, economic troubles, the hard work, who had a hard time looking then at that building as being simply a place of pleasure and beauty. It was too familiar to them to be beautiful. But now people have the opportunity to stand back a little bit, take a look at it, realize that it's endangered. I don't think we could farm today like they did back in the days when this barn was built. Not this kind of acres, because uh, we've gotten bigger acre-wise because you have to to make a living. And These people that laid this barn up, that had to take an enormous amount of time to shape them blocks up and put them up like that. I don't think I'd have the patience. The large barns that were built 50 or 100 years ago served several functions. Under the roof in a large loft area, hay and bedding were stored for the animals which were housed below. Horses were kept in stall. Cows were milked in another area. All right. Some barns even had a corner reserved for chickens. These farms were labor intensive with the farmer owning several teams of horses and employing a number of hired hands. A couple of times during the summer, everyone on the farm pitched in to put up hay. The clover, alfalfa, and prairie grasses were cut at maturity by a mower pulled by a team of horses. After the hay had dried in the hot summer sun, it was loaded onto a wagon. In the old days, the hay was pitched on the wagon by hand, but around 1900, the hay loader came into use. It could hoist the hay into the wagon. It still took three hired hands to drive the team and arrange the hay in the wagon box. At the barn, a system of ropes, pulleys, a track, and a hay fork were used to bring the hay from the wagon into the loft. Again, it was horsepower that did the heavy lifting. Ready, sir? Stay, step 
up. And it required three or four people to accomplish the task. is dry, one person with a tractor and baler does the work of the team of horses and the three hired hands. And one person with a lift moves the bale off the field. In America today, there's an image of people who are not farmers to think that the farm it's romantic. Uh, it looks old in, in some ways. It has a romance, perhaps the shape of the barn or the weathered shingles. Um, and the idea carried by most of us, perhaps, is that it has a way of being permanent in the landscape. But that would be incorrect in viewing what a farm is in, in terms of its life and time. The image that one should have is that it's constantly changing in time. This is the Willis Dam Farm in Columbus County, Wisconsin. Looks like a typical farmstead. It has a large barn, some outbuildings, a couple of silos, an old house. But it didn't always look the way it does today. Back in 1850, the family lived in a center post house and built a barn. By 1900, the farmstead looked like this. By 1950, like this. And by 1990, like this. Not only do the farmsteads change over the years, but so do the barns themselves. This double barn is on the farmstead of the Shaker community in Poland Spring, Maine. There are nine souls living in this last practicing Shaker community in America. Come on, girl. Brother Smith oversees the farming operations. The two current barns were um, built in 1847, and virtually all of, them, all of the material was manufactured, or rather produced, from the property. The granite was harvested from a quarry, which we still own, and the timbers were all cut on the property and fashioned in our own mill. So we were pretty self-sufficient. Very early on, the Shakers, just having drawn very industrious people, were always looking for a better way to do things. We've always embraced modern technology and tried to make improvements, feeling that um, whatever we could contribute to the benefit of mankind was our obligation as Christian people. The barns were built as two separate structures. The rear building housed the oxen, and the front was a stable for horses. In 1896, they were connected so that the brothers could do their chores more easily. There's a little clue that gives away the relative ages of the original barn and the connection. On the front of the horse stable, you'll notice that the windows, I believe, are some of them were 12 over 9 and some of them were 9 over 6. And that's much earlier than the facade on the ox barn, which was from 1896. And you notice that it's 6 over 6 panes. In the early days, oxen were used in the haying operation. Later, the oxen were replaced by tractors, so partitions were built for equipment storage, and the horse stalls were removed in the lower level, which today is a sheep pen. Now, most people count sheep. Brother Smith names them. This is Borealis here. This is Theodora. That's Hypostes. And this is Marie. This is Eos, and Antigone is there with the blue tag. <laughs> this is Mother Marie here, who's the mother of baby Marie over there. <laughs> we have a Juno, and we have a chocolate chip. And some of our names are a little ridiculous, but you had to be there when we named them. <laughs> the sheep are shorn each spring. These sheep are bred for their wool. The most desirable wool has fibers four inches or longer. The secret to shearing is to keep moving around the animal and move the animal 
in order to keep the wool in one piece so that each fleece can be rolled up into a ball. The barn structurally is very sound. It's mostly cosmetic, the work that it needs now. Like the back part of the stable is still pretty abused looking from the horses. It would be nice to have that finished again, too. I would like to have the sides either go back to cedar shingles or to clapboarding like the front. I really don't like asphalt siding, and I'd like to have it go back to its traditional state. And I, I think that is a goal of ours. The typical New England farm of a century ago was small, often enclosed by stone walls. The farms would support a few milk cows, pigs, chickens, and sheep. But in the West, settlement came later. Rural life was different, and still is. These are South Dakota's Black Hills. There are no stone walls, and these are ranches, not farms. They are measured in sections, not acres. This is the Frawley Ranch, actually one of four Frawley ranches. It's spring roundup time. Hank Frawley is the third generation on this ranch. Well, we just refer to this as the Lower Ranch, and this is kind of the heart of our, of our working cattle business. The buildings were constructed over a period of time. Most of those buildings were built uh, by my dad and his brother in the early 1900s. There's the remnants uh, of an old log building there, which goes back to the homestead days, which was made into a tack room. You have a granary, but then they also built a, a newer horse barn and a newer cattle shed. And uh, they somehow came up with the concept of a connecting barn. Four generations of Frawleys and their neighbors gather every year for Roundup. These calves were born during March and April. Like today, you know, we're branding around 300 calves, and uh, the, the bull calves are castrated and made into steers. And then it's important that all these calves receive a vaccination shot when they're young. It's just like the kids, you know, getting their measles shots and their flu shots and their whooping cough shot. The original Henry Frawley started with just a few acres and a love of ranching. Over the years, he bought up additional land from struggling homesteaders. Most of the people who came were farmers, or as they were referred to as sodbusters, and they learned the hard way that this climate and area was ill-suited for farming. And so the people that survived were the people who primarily placed their emphasis on livestock production. On the second day, Roundup moves to the East Ranch, the Anderson Place. These crumbling stone buildings originally were the center of a busy Danish dairy operation. The ranch hands milked a hundred cows a day here. In the old days, if you could milk seven cows an hour and speak Danish, you could get a job here. The key to their success was a spring that was located at the ranch. The spring produces 40 degree water, and it turned out to be a wonderful refrigeration system. And then every day they would, of course, load the fresh milk and cream and butter and cheeses that they had made, and that would be loaded into wagons and then taken up to the Deadwood Lead community where it was sold. The stone walls of these old buildings are falling apart. The long-range plan, of course, is to restore all these buildings, to restore the house, and then to restore, or perhaps we may have to reconstruct the barn. But the real pride and joy of the Frawley ranches is this complex of buildings on the upper ranch. My grandfather Frawley bought it, and he started building a very unique set of barns, which are referred to today as courtyard barns. And this construction went on for years until he finally was able to complete them. And it was a total, complete facility for horses that were being used on a daily basis. The limestone barn which housed Frawley's valued percher on horses was built in the 1880s. Fifteen years later, he built an adjacent courtyard barn 
a wooden structure to showcase his registered purebred Hereford cattle. The combined space of these two barns is over 15,000 square feet. It's a National Historic Landmark. Well, the Frawley Ranch is one of the few historic ranches where all of the original buildings, furnishings, tools, memorabilia have been preserved almost intact. The courtyard barns enclosed the barnyard at all times and protected the valuable cattle and horses from the bitter South Dakota winter winds. These barns represented a design found throughout Europe. Many barn building traditions came to America from the old world. In America, as in the European homeland, barns were built to protect crops, animals, and farm tools from the elements. They came in a variety of shapes and sizes. Each nationality brought a way of constructing rural buildings and laying out the farmstead, and each had an idea of what a farm should resemble. Each tried to create its old world homestead here. The Scandinavians, for example, brought a practice of erecting small, separate log buildings in a loose arrangement. The Germans brought a tradition of half-timbered buildings. Two major building traditions came to dominate barn construction in America. One was the English. They tended to build a one-level thrashing and grain barn. The barn had a central drive with two bays on either side. The central drive was used as a threshing area, a breezeway where grain was flailed to separate the kernels from the husks. The two side bays were a storage space for grain and for hay or straw. The second barn tradition to dominate American barn design was the German, a two-story barn with hay and straw stored above and the animals housed below. If the barn was located on level ground, a ramp gave a team of horses and wagon access to the upper floor. But if the terrain was hilly, the barn was built into the side of a hill or bank and became known as a bank barn. The upper story often extended over the lower to provide a partial cover for the livestock in bad weather. This projection or forebay is one of the striking characteristics of German barns so commonly seen in the mid-Atlantic states. These European barns had considerable influence on American barn design over the years. But America really added something. New construction techniques evolved. Standardized barn plans were created. Old ways were replaced by a new scientific way of doing things. And the unique American barn came into being. It was spacious, modern, readily adaptable to changes in agricultural technology and often painted red. They say that the barns in early New England were painted red uh, primarily because the paint uh, was easy to make. They mixed milk usually with iron filings, iron oxide, and sometimes it was clay in the soil and it made a very strong durable paint. But once when I was going to school many years ago, more than I care to remember, I did a piece of investigative reporting of my own in Indiana and asked around why barns were painted red in that area. And the farmers all said there that barns were painted red because red paint was the cheapest paint you could get. I asked some manufacturers and hardware stores in the area why red paint was indeed the cheapest paint you could get. And they said, because we sell so much of it. <laughs> and I really suspect that that's exactly the reason. They paint their barns red because that's the cheapest paint, and it's the cheapest paint because that's the color they paint their barns. But really, it's a matter of the momentum of tradition. This 100-year-old barn in Clay County, South Dakota, is owned by Helen Anderson Quirk. Her great-grandfather migrated from Sweden and homesteaded here. The large horse barn built in 1894 had uh, 20 stalls to hold 20 horses, and large enough in the center that four horses could be harnessed abreast or harnessed before they were brought outside. It has a huge hayloft. All that we've uh, done to uh, keep the barn in good condition is remill the windows in 1971 and re-shingle in uh, 1975 and painting uh, today.
Why is Mrs. Quirk spending the time and money to maintain the barn? Well, I think a lot of it is respect and appreciation for my forebears building such a fine farm. And there's sentiment for a wonderful childhood here. Memories of roaming around the whole farmstead, freedom to do that. And I have a, an appreciation of history and, and uh, like to keep something that shows uh, agriculture in, in past years. There aren't many old farmsteads left for the future to show what farming was like at one time. The Anderson Horse Barn stands almost like a monument in the center of a busy farming operation. It's a tribute to America's proud agricultural past. But some 100-year-old barns are still the working hub of a farm's activity. Morning is breaking on the Stuart Schlaffer farm in eastern Illinois. Every morning, Stuart drives his Holstein cows into his 115-year-old barn for milking. He'll do it again this evening. You guys go back. Go on. Milking's go on. been a part of Judy and Stuart's chores for the nine years they've been running this farm. Stuart bought the farm from his dad, who milked cows for 30 years. And his dad got the farm from Stewart's grandpa and so on. This barn has seen tens of thousands of head of cattle pass through its doors. Over the years, it's been electrified, added to, jacked up, cemented around, and pulled back into shape when it sagged. Well, when I was 16 years old, I thought I knew everything. And I thought what it should do is tear the barn out and put in a loafing shed and uh, put up a milking parlor and get rid of the old barn completely. And Dad just told me to hang on for a couple years until I got out of school and, you know, think about it. And hang on he did. He realized the old barn could be made useful. With his dad's encouragement, he added free stalls. Next came new piping to make this a grade A milk facility. He attached a milk house. This barn to me means a, it's a symbol of a heritage. It's a piece of material that someone has sculptured and made into a barn that they don't replace anymore at all. My dad died in 1980 and if he'd be able to see the stuff that I've done since he's passed on, I think he'd be proud of everything. The elegant Schlaffer barn was built when American agriculture reigned supreme, and the farmer was lord of his domain. It represented the epitome of grand barn design for the farmer. But not for the super rich. On the shores of Lake Champlain in Vermont is a vast estate. It was established in the late 1880s by Dr. William Seward Webb, a physician turned investor, who married Lila Vanderbilt. While most wealthy New Yorkers built summer homes at Newport, Dr. Webb built a sumptuous farm. The grounds were landscaped by Frederick Law Olmsted, who had designed Central Park. This was America's gilded age, and the castle at the end of the drive is not the living quarters. This is the barn. And just one of them, designed for a man for whom farming was a hobby and money was no object. It is five stories tall and had stalls for 80 teams of mules and horses, shops for blacksmiths, carpenters, painters, and management staff. At one time, several hundred employees were working here. Today, it's a museum and education center. But barns had a modest beginning. The word barn originally meant a door-covered hole in the ground, a place for barley. Eventually, the ground storage hole became a building. When the immigrant settlers came to America, they brought with them construction techniques they used in the old world. 
common to many countries was the tradition of log construction. Logs were laid in tiers, both even and alternating. A second technique, also brought from Europe, was the heavy timber system which was held together by mortise and tenon joints. A mortise hole is cut and fitted with a tenon tongue. The joint is secured with a dowel or pin. Pieces are assembled and then erected in a day in the traditional American barn raising. It continues in the Amish community today. In the 19th century, a new design expanded the space in the loft and eliminated many of the posts and beams. It was open, lightweight, machine cut, standardized, nailed. It looked to some to be too weak, like a balloon, but it wasn't. This system, the Gambrel Roof Barn, became the most popular barn in America. A variation on the Gambrel system is the bow truss. Farmers liked the bow truss because it eliminated the beams altogether and gave them a large open space. Leroy Zenger in Iowa Falls built this one in 1939. It was one of the first in the area. When I come out here and look at it now, I sometimes wonder how I pushed that hand saw so much to do all that work because we didn't have a lot of power equipment at that time. I cut that all by hand with the hand saw. The studs and the plates and the joists and everything was all cut before we ever started raising them. It went along really pretty good because everybody was working at their own speed, really, but we got the whole sum of 45 cents an hour and dinner. These bow truss buildings in Virginia are some of the earliest prefab buildings. They are mail order barns sold by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears offered various adaptations of the principal plan, an open cattle barn, a granary, and a horse barn with its individual windows and stalls. These barns sit on one of America's oldest estates, Meadow Farm, in the foothills of Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. This is a portion of the ancestral lands of Presidents James Madison and Zachary Taylor. Helen Marie Taylor is the current steward of Meadow Farm, which has remained in the Taylor family since 1722. Well, I'm a preservationist at heart, and I like saving vestiges of the past because I think we know how to live in the present and the future better uh, when we know something about our roots. Another barn on the Taylor Estates is this horse barn. It is over 50 feet wide and 200 feet long and surrounded by a covered indoor track. There are stalls for 20 horses, a tack room, and an office. Hay was stored in the loft of this 11,000 square foot building. All in all, there are 2,200 glass panes. And this barn also is a 1930s Sears prefab building ordered through the catalog. To me, they are an absolute miracle. The idea that these were mail order barns is incredible. And uh, I, you'd have to say they've been restored with tender, loving care. <laughs> One of the elements which has driven barn design is the notion of efficiency. In the late 1800s and into the 20th century, a new barn architecture was touted, the round barn. Well, those are unique and uh, fabulous buildings. The livestock were kept in one building and the hay or the feed was uh, concentrated and fed at the center of the building uh, for labor efficiency and for space efficiency. There also was the idea that uh, manure collection would be more efficient in a building like that because the manure could be moved toward the outside 
of the building and uh, providing for a warmer, cleaner environment. One of the agricultural brochures of the time calculated that since cattle were wedge-shaped, more could eat at one time if they were fed in a circle. The problem, of course, is that the wedges tended to move around. The idea of a round building in itself uh, inherently is more space efficient, but it also is quite costly to build. And, uh, we're lucky to have them around today. This barn near Manhattan, Illinois, isn't exactly round. It's 20-sided and was built from lumber salvaged from the Chicago Exposition of 1893. If you were to rebuild this barn today, the cost of the lumber alone would be almost a half million dollars. This barn was built in 1908 by Jason Manchester in Lakeview, Ohio. The barn served as a model farm plant for its owner, who gained a reputation for his success in agricultural improvement programs. It is 102 feet in diameter and 90 feet high. It will hold over 150 tons of hay, 5,000 bushels of corn, 15,000 bushels of oats, 16 horses, and 100 head of cattle. It was kind of a fad of that era because most all the round barns that I've ever heard about were built, I think, from about 1895 to 1915. So this was about the middle of the, what I would call the round barn era. And uh, there were cattle in the barn, but uh, it's not ever been used real hard for any type of livestock. The Manchester barn is a three-story structure with an interior silo surrounded by a corn crib. The top floor of the barn was designed exclusively for hay storage. This is the silo, which extends to the lower level. On the second floor, the corn crib encircles the silo. This alley is wide enough for two teams of horses and wagons to pass each other. Further to the outside, on the second level, oats were stored. The holes in the floor permitted the oats to fall by gravity to wagons below. Finally, on the bottom floor, the livestock was kept. The barn now houses a seed operation. Tim raises certified soybeans and wheat for wholesale and retail sale. Recently, Tim invested in new grain cleaning equipment. Tim's grandfather actually started the grain cleaning operation in this barn in the 1930s. The height of that is a big advantage. A lot of the new processing plants you'll see will have an elevator after each stage of the cleaning process. We can accomplish a lot of that by gravity. The Manchester barn has been a prominent feature of the central Ohio landscape over the years. Tim's father recognized its importance and in 1975 made a considerable investment in repairing the roof. Now, Tim is the fifth generation custodian of the barn. It would certainly be hard for me to let it fall down, but uh, the fact that we're still using it productively for this seed operation doesn't really make it that much of a question about keeping it, especially with all this new equipment I'm putting in. It would have to deteriorate awfully severely before I would consider moving that out. So I'm really committing myself to it now. The round barn represented the idealized geometric pattern. The barn symbolized progress, and they are beautiful. Farmers have always tried to enhance the visual appeal of their barns in the supports they built to hold up the roofs. colors they select to protect and decorate the wood. In the hardware they placed on the doors. And in the weather vanes they mounted on the cupolas.
In the mid-Atlantic area, the bricklayers vented the lofts of the barns by working intricate designs into the walls. On this barn, the symbols of communion are depicted. Above, a bundle of wheat. And below, a chalice. And the communion wafer. The story goes that the owner of this barn asked the bricklayers to create his own image astride his favorite prize racehorse. But he didn't pay the artists on time, so they changed the design to show him seated on a jackass. Because the horse was so valuable to the farmer or rancher, the horse barn or stable received special attention. It was usually the most attractive building on the farmstead, often better constructed and better looking than the house. The better kept the barn, the better the farmer. It was a visible sign of how successful he was and how well he took care of that which was important. The house is utterly unimportant. Many a, many a pioneer wife complained about that, that she lived in her sod house or log, log house a lot longer than she wanted to because the man of the family insisted that first things came first, and that was the barn, not the house. There is a rich variety of barn shapes, sizes, and styles. In the south, open tobacco barns dot the landscape. In New England, connected buildings dominated farm architecture design and construction for years. These square barns are clustered near Adair, Illinois. This design represents the individual stamp of a local craftsman who has left his mark on one small area of mid-America. But the barns across this country are fast disappearing. As agriculture becomes consolidated, as large farm operations buy out small farms, as fewer farmers cultivate more acres, farmsteads are abandoned and buildings collapse. Some barns no longer serve a need in today's highly mechanized farm operation. Others fall victim to urban development. But some are saved. Five acres of this 80-acre farm now provide the principal income for Al Langhalls and his family. It's not corn, and it's not soybeans. It's Silver Queen Artemisia, which Debbie sells with other flowers and herbs in the barn which once sheltered the cows Al milked as a kid. The interior of the barn has had the most change. We insulated and lowered the ceiling and poured the floor because it was just a dirt floor in there before that. And a lot of cleaning, <laughs> much cleaning, weeks and weeks. <laughs> we wanted to keep the barn looking as much as possible like it would have years ago so that people would know in the minute they came in that this was a barn. This is the Santa Ynez Valley of California, just north of Santa Barbara. It's early September. Here, another old dairy barn has been converted. Now, it's a winery. Winemaking is, is something very traditional, and therefore, uh, it's nice when it can be, um, uh, as it were, attached to something else that is also traditional. The space that a barn affords is perfect for a winery because you've got the height for the tanks, the tanks being very large. You've got the air cooling, which is a natural air cooling system. And that is very, very important in, in winemaking to, to have a building that stays nice and cool. barn was
was built a hundred years ago near Kozat, Nebraska, to shelter six teams of Belgian horses. The sides appear to have been added as lean-tos, but actually, this was the original design. It's being moved into Kozad to become a shop for a local contractor. But only a few barns can be rescued by recycling them as shops, museums, or restaurants. If the barns are to be saved, it's going to be up to the farmer to do it. In 1987, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and Successful Farming magazine launched a national program to assist farmers to find new agricultural uses for their old barns, to adapt the barn that Grandpa built so it could serve the needs of today's modern farmer. They called it Barn Again. A lot of people that we heard from almost secretly had this desire to save their barn and, and use it or rehabilitate it, but it just wasn't the thing to do, and they were almost embarrassed about it, uh, afraid of what the neighbors would say. They'd say, you know, old Joe's gone crazy. He's sinking all this money into that old barn. Uh, when Successful Farming came out and uh, endorsed the idea of using an older barn, it really reinforced these people's ideas. It validated their ideas, and they kind of came out of the closet and said, yes, I'm going to do that too. If a farmer needs a building, say to store his combine or to store hay or whatever. If he's in the market for a building uh, and he can compare what it would cost to construct a new building with what it would co cost to rehabilitate his barn, he can make a um, you know, pretty straight comparison, uh, practically speaking, on whether it's worth saving his barn. Ted and Janice King of Knoxville, Illinois, participated in the Barn Again program. They took out stalls, lofts, and beams to create an open storage area. Because farming is specialized today, there's no longer a need for horse stalls, cattle pens, and chicken coops. I think it is an important concept that if you're going to save buildings, they have to be functional for modern day purposes. And we needed large round hay bale storage and machinery storage, so that really worked in well with what we needed. I wanted to put a metal roof on because that is the most cost-effective roof to put on. And since this part of the roof above us was wood shingles, um, and I love the old wood shingles, I wanted to repair those. But we soon learned that they were in bad enough shape that that wasn't going to happen, that we couldn't repair those. They had to be replaced. But Janice resisted the metal roof. While she wasn't able to find wood shingles at a price the Kings could afford, she made a deal with a lumber yard in Bloomington on shakes. Everybody likes the appearance of it, and even though um, we have been told that shakes are not the original roofing material, that shingles would have been accurate, I thought it had a much more similar appearance than what the metal roofing would have had. The original structure was built 120 years ago. It was a showplace in the community. The sandstone for the foundation was quarried right here on the farm. This whole area of the foundation had completely crumbled away, and I, we're not really sure what the problem was that caused that, but obviously there was moisture that was getting in here over the years and um, had really rotted away some of the, of the sandstone. Earlier repairs had used Portland cement as mortar. During the freezing and thawing process, the cement held but the sandstone blocks crumbled. Janice tried to find someone to solve the problem. So I would interview these people and say, well, what do you think is causing this problem on these piers with the sandstone falling away? And they'd look at it and say, well, I think the cows are rubbing on that and causing that. So immediately I would cross them off the list. Eventually, Janice found a mason who was willing to make a mortar softer than the sandstone. People who are working with, with historic buildings actually have to talk to craftspeople who know old buildings. And in the case of masonry, you know what materials are in old mortars and are willing to work with you to replicate those. Most, that, that one looks pretty good. I think that one's all right, but if it's bumpy, you have to get those off, like okay. this. Mm -hmm. 
The section of the barn now being restored as a lean-to added about 10 years after the original structure was completed. The brick will be recycled to maintain the look of the old barn. John Tingley is laying a cement block foundation. <coughs> the old foundation that was torn out here was real shallow. And it was, what we're trying to do is get below frost here with a, we've got a concrete footing in here now and come up with block for economy's sake, and then we'll just put a brick face on it. That will, that'll be all that'll show above the ground. And uh, it'll look just like the old foundation that was here, except it'll be below frost, and it should last a lot longer. We have had hundreds of people tour this barn, and um, most of them local. Uh, they were people who really wanted to see and love old barns. People feel a kinship to, and it, that is one of the links to the past that they feel. It's kind of a window to the past. This barn literally belongs to the community. It is a landmark. It's something that, even though we own it, um, they feel ownership. People would come up to me, you know, and thought it was really great that we're saving that old barn because they really thought that that was important and thought that more people should do it. The man who renovated the interior of the King Barn was Dave Cholik. Cholik began by converting old barns into covered bridges. Now he and his crew work full-time across the country, renovating 30 barns each year. He's in Chesney, Michigan, where he'll turn John Weisenberger's old barn into an open storage space. And when we go through the barns, we recognize that most barns are renovated about every 20 years. And if you were to go through this barn, you could see some of the things in the renovation that were not there in the original part of the barn. So about every 20 years, barns do get renovated. This barn will get a renovation as never before. The original barn had stanchions for 16 milking cows at one end and stables for horses at the other. The support was a King Post truss construction which held up the loft and the gambrel roof. It had a drive-through with partitions on either side. Dave will build a truss on either side of the drive-through as a new support for the wall. What we're doing here in this barn is going to be a typical barn renovation. Uh, this is a simple post and beam barn style construction. It's what you would see like on a covered bridge or on any bridge that you see today. This barn is in really good shape. First of all, it's got a good roof and has had a good roof for a long period of time. If it has a good roof, that usually means that you don't have to worry about any beams being rotted from water leaking in, loft beams, floor beams, sill beams. It usually means the barn is pretty well protected. This new truss Dave is mounting will replace the beams which held up the building and supported the loft with its tons of hay and straw. Next, Dave will perform some radical surgery. The old horse stables will go. The partitions on either side of the drive. The milk cow stanchions. The loft. The main reason we want to take these lofts out is because they were built to give a lot of area up above them for storing hay for the, both the cattle and for the horses that used to work the farm. What we're taking them out for now is because the farmer, of course, no longer uses horses. What he has is he has large equipment, some large tractors, and they have to have the higher height clearance in order to be able to store them in these old barns. But change doesn't always come easy for a man who's done chores morning and night for 50 years in a building where every board, peg, and beam has meaning. Kind of sad in a way, you know, because you know, they do bring back a lot of memories. You know, I'd, I'd kind of forgotten all about the horses and stuff, you know. And I got to thinking, well, this is where the horses used to stand, you know. This is where they used to eat. And, and then you know, I can remember the bowl and stuff, you know, that we always had. And... The farmer doesn't like to see a tearing at things. It hurts. Yeah, it's sort of like there goes a part of us. But um, when you open it up, 
and he gets his big equipment in, and he comes to the realization that the barn is going to be saved, that 90% of the structure is going to still be there. He feels better about that. And then you start talking to him about it and say, you know, don't forget to bring your neighbors in so that they can see it, so that they can understand how this principle works. And then they start to take pride in it again. And usually if you show him how many times the barn has been changed, because farming practice has changed, then he feels like he's just a continuation of that process. As a last step, a new door will be cut into the end. And a smaller loft will be made above the new door from recycled lumber. We're going to put in a big 18-foot wide door opening. It's going to have about 13 and a half foot of clearance. We need that kind of clearance for the farmer to get into his barns today in order to make them functional. Otherwise, uh, the barns are just going to simply continue to go to waste. But with this type of approach, we, uh, we can usually save any barn. A new door frame must be installed for the large opening. This frame will also support the new loft. We try to use beams that were already here. We're going to use as much of the old material as possible. And even if we have to bring lumber in from the outside, we try to get beams from an old existing barn and, and you know, make it look the same. And also, it's much stronger. Set, go. Good enough. You got on me. Oh, that. Pick it up, push this way, okay. Well, okay. Finally, the old interior supports are pulled out. cost to John Weisenberger for Cholik to make all these changes? $4,000. No use having a building here that you can't use. You know, you might just as well have something you can use and make it worthwhile. That's the way I look at it. So. Ready? Yep. Yeah. to John Weisenberger's old barn is a new building. It has metal sides, a flatter roof, and no loft. The buildings are much more specific in their purpose today. Uh, a building is built for machinery storage, or for grain storage, uh, or for livestock production, but not for all three. And also, the weight of the cladding of the metal uh, clad building is somewhat less than the older wood frame, uh, wood construction buildings. Therefore, they can go to wider and wider spans, which is absolutely necessary for today's machinery uh, uh, and grain storage operations. I think today's modern farm building is a very, very sleek, uh, pretty building. Um, I like them very much. I like the old buildings, too. Every era has its characteristics. Uh, and I think the, the era of the uh, 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and on into the next century, uh, we'll find our place in, in uh, architectural history and in agriculture. The barns of the past three decades may very well find their place in architectural history. But the question is, will they find a place in American culture? Will they conjure up the past? Hold the memories. Reflect the tradition. Are they made of the same stuff the old barns were made of? Barns represent everything that people imagine early American agriculture to represent. The hard work and the good times. The hardy yeoman, you know, who still did all of his own work. It represents, unlike the factory, where you are somebody else's employee, or slave, depending on how you look at it. In the barn, it's a sign of independence, that you were your own employer. You ran your own life. 
and as full as you could make that barn was as full as you could make your life. Um, it represents in some ways a, a lost innocence in America because now farming has become industrial and corporate, but then the barn was a sign of the independent family operating and, and that was their pride. The family always put their money into the barn before they put it into the house. Purchase a video cassette of Barn Again, call 1 800 228 4630. 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. That's 1 800 228 4630.